Gear Tasting Radio is brought to you by Imminent Threat Solutions. ITS provides knowledge that empowers individuals with indispensable skill sets to explore the world and prevail against all threats. Right now, as a special thank you for all podcast listeners, we're offering 10% off in the ITS store. Simply use the code GTR to save 10% at store.itstactical.com. Welcome to Gear Tasting Radio, where we offer an in-depth look into the usage and philosophy behind the equipment in our lives. I'm joined by Rob Henderson. Hello. And myself, Brian Black. And today we're going to be talking about camouflage, <laughs> which is, contrary to popular belief, not an invisibility cloak. What? Yeah, I know. Big surprise. You're supposed to just be able to disappear. <laughs> You're supposed to just put on camouflage and nobody can see you. <laughs> really what we want to hammer home today is taking a look at what's termed as visual saliency. So there's there's about, I would say, six, seven criteria that, that fall under that visual saliency. And a lot of the, the topics, or sorry, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this episode come from some of our articles on camouflage. Um, many years ago in ITS, we did something called a camouflage comparison. We actually did two of them, where we went out into the wilderness, um, into a couple of different locations, and we actually came up with some criteria for testing, and I'm always hesitant to use the word testing, but this was truly testing, which means we we had conditions and um, measurable analytics that we could... It's like the most science thing. Over. Yeah, as science as we could get as right. non-scientists. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and really what that consisted of is us taking a mannequin out in the field and taking tops or jackets from all these different camouflage patterns, and we photographed them in, you know, the same environment in the same conditions as best we could um, using the same criteria. So, you know, based, back then we used a, a Canon 40D, if I remember, and we did this in two locations. We did it up in the Wichita Mountains, which is in Oklahoma, and then we went down to Big Bend in down to kind of the southwest tip of Texas, um, down to Big Bend Na- National Park, and we did a comparison out there too, um, which, you know, looked really... Um, <laughs> <laughs> looked really suspicious in, in certain oh, I'm situations, sure. and we had to deal with the park service a little bit. But once <laughs> once they knew what we were doing, they left us alone. But yeah. um, we did try to check with them first. But anyway, what we were doing down there is just setting up something that was repeatable and something that was that we could really take a lot of photos of different camouflage and then actually come back and evaluate those after the fact. And, and really, camouflage as a whole, trying to determine whether camouflage works is tricky because – just like, you know, one pattern might look really good down in Big Bend, but when you get out to Vegas or California, it's just not going to work. So yeah. it's really, I wouldn't say it's, it leaves room for interpretation, but it's just, you really need to look at the, uh, it's situationally dependent. That's really the sure. best way to say it. You know, it depends where you're at. Um, and it also depends a lot on the visual saliency, which are the things we're going to talk about, because camouflage to me, anyway, in my opinion, is useless unless you're following good principles to camouflage yourself, not even taking into account what you're wearing. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Well, not just that. I mean, it also comes down to the stuff you have around you. Right. Because, you know, a lot of people will do head-to-toe multicam <laughs> with a black rifle or something like right. that. And so, like, you're when we get into these points about what makes camouflage camouflage, you'll start to see that it's... There's a lot of factors, and anything that is is not camouflaged will stick out really sure. bad in those situations. Absolutely, and and really, what these are are the way I look at these are these are best practices. Like you really need to understand these these visual saliency points to be able to understand camouflage. You can't just put on camouflage clothing and, and think, oh, I'm I'm going to blend in more because I have camouflage. Sure. But there's a lot of things that make you stick out like a sore thumb that have nothing to do with what you're wearing. Right. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. And I think we get a qu- we've gotten a question a couple times that's like, what's the best camouflage pattern? Right. And so even at the end of all of this, when we're done, the answer will be, <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> right. You know, because we'll go over, there's a lot of different zones. There's a lot of different places you can be. There's a lot of different factors. Like you said, it's not just about the thing that you're wearing it's also about like what you're doing yep. and stuff like that the first thing is movement and that's probably the biggest factor that that comes into play when you're talking about camouflage and, and when you're going to hear these things you're going to think well duh of course you know but they're really things that you have to think about at all times and, and contemplate when you're trying to blend in like it's not just a oh yeah i know that in the back of my mind i'm just gonna mm-hmm. i'll kind of adhere to that 
Well, if you don't take these things into account, you are going to stick out like a sore thumb, even if you're head to toe multicam. Yeah, and that's and in the right environment to use multicam. Sure. So movement means you know shapes moving on, you know, in a static environment. Obviously, if you see movement, or even an animal that detects movement. I mean, hunting is a great example of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, animals are looking for movement. Obviously, they're you know they're listening too. But at the same time, movement in a environment that's static where there's not supposed to be movement is going to be seen. Big visual cue yeah, exactly. that something's going on. And, you know, vice versa, in a dynamically moving environment, if you see static objects, that's going to stick out like a That, I thought, was a great point that I hadn't thought of before, is that, yeah, if everything around you is moving and you're stationary, that's going to stick out just right. as bad. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then, so, I mean, movement's a huge thing. Mm-hmm. So that's why one of, the, one of the, the best things you can do, let's say an airplane's flying overhead. And you're not in any camouflage, you're in an environment, and you're like, oh, crap, they're going to see me. I mean, most people are, you know, might try to run or do something like that. The best thing you can do is stay completely still and just reduce your silhouette or reduce your footprint. We'll get into silhouette in a minute, but, you know, that's one of the best things you can do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what, that's the recognition that, you know, people are going to be looking for something moving. That's what they're detecting is, you know, a human or a moving object. Because so. they're not, uh, not everybody's switched on all the time. Right. You know, so if, the, if someone is actively pursuing you, yes, they may be looking. But like you said, overhead or if you're hiding from somebody, I mean, it's a hide and seek thing. You play hide and seek as a kid. Just don't move. Well, <laughs> per- the perfect example is like FLIR video from a police helicopter. Uh-huh. You can see somebody move, like under FLIR, you- movement is like, oh my God, yeah. there he is. You I know, lose him just, sometimes. I'm yeah. like, oh, wait, there he yeah, is. He's moving. Exactly. So, yeah. so think about what you're looking for in, in something like that. Like if that FLIR camera and that helicopter was flying over and that person was completely static and still, it would they would have a hard time detecting him. Not impossible, yep. no. but it would definitely make the job more difficult. Absolutely. So the next thing is shine um, from reflective surfaces. So this is... You know, metal and glass and sweat even um, that could be picked up um, as, you know, being a reflective object. And the biggest example in my mind of this is glass from a scope or a Mm -hmm. pair of binoculars or something reflecting off the sun and Mm -hmm. and causing a glare or a flash. Um, Same goes for anything metal that's not um, matte or doesn't have any kind of, you know, flat surface to it. Um, that'll definitely produce a, a glint or a or a flash. So. Well, and I really like that we have sweat listed down too, because that's yeah. I mean, even if you have your your kill flash on there and all of your zippers are coated or anything like that, if you're sweating, you're not taking care of it and yeah. moving or uh, hiding yourself correctly. You're still gonna have <laughs> that glint. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up the kill flash because that's that's something you can buy. It's an off the off the shelf product. Mm-hmm. Um, it's made by a company called Tenebrex, and they make them for different. Different optics for rifles, um, also for binoculars. A lot of the the common military binoculars have uh, kill flashes available for them, and they just fit over there, and it's like a screen or a mesh. You can still see through it, but at the same yep. time, it prevents that reflection from coming back out of the of the glass too. And I've seen a couple of people like I have the Aimpoint Pro, and I just bought the kill flash for that. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that say, well, it darkens the image that I'm seeing in mm-hmm. the Pro. But that's one of those, it's a situationally dependent thing. Yep. Do you care about your image being darkened or do you care about the reflection? So right. you know, you're not going to use it all the time, but it's a great thing to and have. And you can definitely argue like, hey, by the time they see the glint from my glass, they'll be dead already. <laughs> sure. But, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, something you can do, too, if you don't want to buy a commercially off-the-shelf product uh, for that, if one isn't available, is you can use pantyhose. You can literally take put pantyhose over the top of your, or on the... On the front of your scope, and that's the stylish way to the, do it. It's the poor man's kill flash. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> get the pan of hoses. Um, and then shape is another big one for um, yeah. visual saliency. So, obviously, human shapes attract attention because we're trained. Humans to are recognize. super good at yeah. seeing humans. It's yeah, exactly. Weird. It's kind of weird. It is, and it's just like uh, kind of a, a ball cap is the worst thing. That's the worst <laughs> example. I mean. You wear a ball cap, even if it's multicam, and that thing's going to yeah. stick out because of just the, the like general shape that it has. The most recognizable yeah. silhouette. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's overseas. A, a ball cap is going to immediately identify you as an American, too. Yeah. So there's there's that. <laughs> they see your shadow, and they know a lot about you. Yeah. So, there. you know, what you can do to break up shape a lot of the time, too, is, I mean, that's why, you know, Gilly was invented and mm-hmm. stuff like that, too, because it's great at, at breaking up those shapes. You know, even putting some some brush or something on like let's say all you had is a ball cap just putting some brush and things that you find mm-hmm. you know in nature there 
in amongst your cap or something yeah. like that would be a huge thing to break well, up that pattern. <laughs> There's a reason boonie caps have that webbing strip sewn around yep. them. And it's yep. not to store all your cool guy stuff. Yeah. You know, stick sticks and brush and that kind of stuff. I thought in that's for my Zippo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my, my peace and love button. Yeah. One of the things I think is great about Gilly is that your the design of the Gilly is to take the environment you're going to be in mm-hmm. and make that. And so I've, I've read stories, I forget, from where, but they, the snipers would go into the areas they're going to be operating and they would make the suits there mm-hmm. to have live foliage on there and they'd have to be replaced every couple of days because that stuff dies and dries out. So that's kind of like the ultimate in camouflage when you want to make yourself a part of the environment. Yeah, just having kind of a base color of your ghillie that's that's somewhat similar to the environment you're going to be in is, is a great starting point mm-hmm. and then adding, you know, foliage Extras. and stuff too. And I know when we were talking with John about that, um, John, who runs Cheer Group, that's been out to a couple of our musters, he doesn't like using natural foliage. Mm-hmm. Um, he likes kind of knowing the environment he's going to be in beforehand and, and do that because he said it leaves it leaves sign everywhere because that sure. stuff eventually drops off your ghillie yeah. and everyone's like, what's this little yeah. branch right here? Or you're and, breaking and if, twigs off Yeah, and, if, and you're, yeah. if you're trained in um, tracking like he is, you see stuff like that. That's a dead giveaway that someone's, you know, crawling around and. It's a super off. good point. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, that's awesome. Um, next is silhouette. So that's that's contrast or you know a blob against a background, and that's one of the biggest things that I think that you can take from from everything we're talking about is is silhouette. It's huge, um, and you know you can run and hide all you want to, but if if you're producing a silhouette. Um, you know, if you basically the biggest example I can think of of this is, you know, standing up on a ridge line. Sure. So that's going to your silhouette against, you know, with the sun at your back standing up and somebody standing in front of you. I mean, it's just, you blatant. just yeah, it's just super blatant. So, you know, and that and that can happen not on a ridge line too. It can happen, you know, lower on a hill or something like that. You can produce a silhouette that's, you know, you may not even realize you're producing it. So the the closer you can be to the background, if that makes sense, the less silhouette you will produce. Yeah. So that's a good way to think of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Next is color and texture. So, you know, obviously blue in a jungle environment would stand out and low texture in a higher environment would would definitely stand out too. I like that one too. Yeah. Especially if you have like rocked areas where it's a lot of texture in the rock Mm -hmm. and you're, it's very smooth, that's going to stand out. And, uh, you know, vice versa. Yeah, and it's a good argument for, you know, actually uh, uh, camouflage patterns that have, you know, I guess I would call it fake texture, but, you know, pattern, different mm-hmm. pattern in the camouflage mm-hmm. is, will help you with uh, backgrounds like that, too. And, again, that's a that's a situation where, you know, breaking up your pattern um, with texture, and that's that's the other thing Gilly provides. It provides texture. It's not, oh. it's not just a, you know, a, a pattern breakup. It's also kind of a, a texture thing, too. Very true. Um, and then there's shadow. So, you know, our, our minds can calculate shapes from shadow, and that's something that is... And that falls in kind of with the silhouette. Yep. Like, we're able to distinguish something's off mm-hmm. with with shadow. Yeah, and that's kind of the deal with silhouette, too. You're pretty, you know, it's kind of, they're, they're kind of one and the same a little bit with that, too. Um, obviously, silhouette's just a shape thing, whereas shadow's, you know, throwing a shadow. Sure. And that kind of probably makes more sense with my analysis of staying close to you know the background but yeah um that's definitely where shadow comes into play there and then just spacing too i mean just if a couple of things in a row will produce the that spacing that nature does not have Mm -hmm. you know there's no straight lines in nature so it's chaotic yeah that's a that's a big deal too straight lines are, are bad news yeah but yeah, that's that's kind of the visual saliency aspect of camouflage, and I feel like that's that's the biggest thing I would tell somebody if I got asked the question, you know, what camouflage pattern is great. I was like, well, first of all, it's going to depend on where you're your, going, your situation, yeah. you know, the area you're you're operating in. Um, then it's going to depend on your adherence to visual saliency or your ability to follow those principles. Yep. So. I guess if I were to break down the different regions, we kind of took a look at this based on the United States. And obviously, if you're not in the United States and listening to this, your situation is going to vary from what we're talking about. I'm sorry for being so U.S. centric. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a lot of different different environments here in the United States, um, way more than I thought we did when we started yeah, really researching. Yeah, I was, was going to guess three or four. Yeah. But it ends up... So you've got, more. you know, we we've got the... 
humid continental is what it's called, and that's in the north to northeast. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got marine slash west coast, and that's kind of the Pacific Northwest. Even though it says west coast, it's really kind of more um, more north of that, more yeah. in the PNW area. Then you've got kind of a south to southeast uh, with a humid subtropical environment. Even parts of California and Baja, California, have a Mediterranean environment. Mm -hmm. Then you've got arid and semi-arid in the west. And then in the Rockies, you've got a highland environment. So, you know, that's a good seven different environments within the United States. And that's not even counting, I think, some parts we saw, like little specks that were subarctic or something like that. Yeah, like a subarctic area. Yeah, which looked... I don't know. It looked to me that it was more like agree. Montana yeah. was or like something Montana. like that. And I think that depends, too, on the time of year. Yeah. Because for most of anything north of Tennessee, mm-hmm. for six months of the year, white is covering the ground. Mm-hmm. So that completely changes up the dynamic. Well, yeah, and that's the thing, too. Even though there's seven different, you know, I guess, climates mm-hmm. that we have here in America, there's also four different seasons sure. in most parts of the country. So that's really going to change, too. Yeah. You know, which is where different camouflage pattern colorations come into into play. And, and I think that's the answer overall is that you should have varying types of camouflage mm-hmm. if that's something that you're into. You know, you if you live in an area where it snows a large portion of the year and you don't have white type camouflage, well, it's not going to blend very well mm-hmm. unless you're in an area that doesn't have any snow. Yeah, or unless you're in an area where there's uh, scrub brush sure. or something like that that's mm-hmm. an evergreen that stays green all the yep. time. And maybe, and I, maybe you wear... a you know, uh, a multicam top or something in, you know, white pants yeah. or something like that. You know? Just so, throw them off. Yeah. You have to stay in front of this bush. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's it's very interesting getting into camouflage, and it's something yeah. I've always been super interested in. Um, I know back in the early days of ITS, back in 2009, there was the big camouflage controversy of, <laughs> you know, the Army selecting the new camouflage pattern and, you know, how multicam got got ousted as mm-hmm. as the choice because of because of government decisions and things like that. I mean it was a huge a huge controversy. I mean we right. call it the camouflage controversy really is what it needs to be called because the government spent a lot of money and yeah. time choosing ACU or really ACU stands for Army it's, Combat Uniform, uh, so it's really UCP yeah. is the name. Which blends in really well with that one lady's couch. Yes, there's a great photo circulating on the internet showing how well UCP blends in with the couch. And, and that's about it. It's really unfortunate the the military and the government spent so much money issuing UCP stuff to yeah. everybody to only come now back later and out. yeah decide that I think Scorpion was the, the winner It looks lately. really familiar. Scorpion as a pattern looks super familiar to me. It looks a lot like that multicam. Yeah, pattern. it's weird how yeah. that happens. Anyway, yes. <laughs> it's very much like multicam. There's some similar there's some there's some differences there. Striking that, similarities. Yeah. You know, I think that um, one of the other things that gets brought up when you talk about camouflage is that people mistake it for like you said in the, in the beginning, it's not an invisibility cloak. So I know that you've experimented with like mass gray and, ca- mm-hmm. and pattern things that wouldn't be considered camouflage patterns, yeah. but end up working really well at things like nighttime. Well, mm-hmm. you know, that, that quote I said with the non invisibility cloak, um, I think that's so fresh on my mind because I was, I've been coming off of this night vision class that I did at Tolerate Group. And that's one thing that he said is that, you know, night vision's not an invisibility cloak. And mm-hmm. it's true. Same goes for camouflage. It's, you know, you have to practice sound principles within those environments to be able to utilize those, the different technology, whether that's mm-hmm. night vision, whether that's camouflage. It really makes a big difference. So, yeah. um, you know, along those lines of what you said with the mass gray stuff is we've noticed in some of the stuff we've done at night with our practicals at muster and stuff like that, that mass gray does really well, um, not only under night vision, but just in dark in general. So... I've really been a, a big fan of that, even though it's not a true camouflage pattern. It's just a color. Yeah. Um, but it does it does really well. And that comes down to what are you doing and what what's the outcome you're looking for, yeah. which is blending in. I, I think that we get a question occasionally, which is what's a good urban camouflage? And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are looking for a pattern or something like that. But usually that ends up being, and we've talked about before about being the gray man and stuff. So that might be blue jeans and a t-shirt, you mm-hmm. know, depending on where you are, because you, I mean, you're not going to, you could blend in really well with this dumpster, but then you might not blend in really well with right. that wall. So right. it's better to just blend in with the people yeah. versus, you know, oh, this is my, what is that? Uh, digital black, white, and gray, <laughs> like old school camo yeah. for like video games. Yeah. You're talking about like the 
the stuff that looks like woodland, but it's black and white. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's not gray. digital. Yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. the right the SWAT camo mm-hmm. or early early nineties early urban camo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I think is funny too is when you talk about urban, urban camouflage, it's really, it's more jeans and a t-shirt in most yeah. environments than it is really camouflage. It's it's just blending in. Sure. So, I think when you step outside of an inver- urban environment, that's when k- true camouflage mm-hmm. comes into play. Um, you know, I would say in an urban environment, camouflage could be like a trash bag or a right. You know, like the Metal Gear box yeah. over your head type thing. You know, yeah. it's like absolutely. Why is that box moving? Yeah. You know, hey, that comes back to yeah, exactly. Where, visual saline. <laughs> visual. Saliency. But yeah. I mean, that you know, it also it mixes because if I see multicam in an airport, that sticks out to me. Mm-hmm. Versus if I see Agreed. stark black Cordura in the woods, that sticks out to me. Mm-hmm. So there's a good there's a a, a melding point you can get to with it absolutely and that's why camouflage is so interesting to me is because there's there's so it's so multifaceted it's not just sure. a i'm gonna buy this camo and it's gonna be the be all end all yeah. which is really why i've liked seeing multicam branch into their other variations like black and arid and uh, alpine and things like mm-hmm. that they've really kind of taken that same because they've got a good pattern it blends in if if it's in the right environment, multicam is phenomenal yep. because of the pattern breakup that it that it offers within the camouflage, and it's great to see them branching into those those other environments too. Because what they're doing is basically what we were talking about with sure. the, with the environments in the United States. They're trying to take a look at that and say, okay, well, how can we port over this proven camouflage to other environments? So I think it's really cool. Yeah, and I've, I think you were mentioning something about multicam black being really good under IR. Yeah, too. I saw a couple of photos. I think they were on Instagram. Somebody was comparing multicam versus multicam black and they were basically comparing is there hype around this and mm-hmm. they were hitting it with an ir flood and multicam really lights up and you can mm-hmm. see the pattern and i can tell even in the night vision oh that's multicam because i'm used to the pattern but then he, you know he switched over to the multicam black and it was like it disappeared into the hmm. skyline or whatever it was that he was comparing it to so that was really interesting well i know there's also something with uh textile manufacturing uh with nir stuff so that's near infrared so they try to do everything they can within the the fabric construction to make it kind of inherently um infrared Mm -hmm. so or to blend into that environment and i think that's what you get whenever you start looking at because you can get you can get multicam bdu pants for twenty dollars at the Mm -hmm. surplus store but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same pants that you're going to get by getting a set of combat pants or something like that from a good trusted manufacturer so you may not be getting that near ir fabric in those and that's that's a good point too some of the higher end stuff has to do that the other thing that i've noticed that a lot of people don't mention when they talk about the especially higher price brands is the flame resistance and the no drip factor on a lot of that stuff so the cheaper stuff doesn't have that and will catch fire and it just yeah and, it really yeah. depends on the, the makeup of the material because mm-hmm. you know like a, a 50 50 nyco is nylon and cotton and it's you know and it's going to do that yeah exactly for, you know it's not going to do it as much as 100 percent nylon will right uh, because it's got cotton in it, but mm-hmm. um, that's something to to pay attention to as well, I guess. Yeah. If flame resistance is if that's something important. that you're concerned about. Yeah. All right, so let's do some questions over coffee. Awesome. So this one comes from Benjamin uh, through email. Benjamin says, "I work in a lot of tropical hot areas where humidity is high and it rains at some point every day." Uh, We work outside and only shut down for lightning. I know you've gone over just about every topic. However, everything I read about here or in my own research seems to be made to keep you dry and warm. I'm looking for some gear I can wear that keeps me dry outside as well as inside. Seems a little pointless to wear rain gear if I'm going to get just as soaked from sweat. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I'm seeing there is high humidity. So he's working in a high humidity environment. It's raining. Mm -hmm. um, And he's not looking to stay warm because he's in a warm environment. It's hot. I get it. Um, so it's actually, the answer to that is actually counter to what he thinks it's going to be. Um, I think what he's thinking is that if he puts on rain layers, he's Mm -hmm. going to get warm. But I would argue the fact that if your body is doing what it naturally wants to do, which is to sweat, to internally regulate its own temperature, which is what's going on. He's in a humid environment. He's going to be sweating. Um, you need a way for that sweat to exit the system, so to speak. Whether that system is a T-shirt, whether it's a jacket and a mm-hmm. shirt, or whatever whatever kind of layering system he he wants to, to wear, yeah. you have to allow the perspiration to exit. Sure. So most, I say most, um, 
lot of a lot of rain jackets are designed to not let water in, mm-hmm. but they also can't let moisture out. Yeah, which is why you want something like a Gore-Tex fabric that's inherently going to allow moisture to escape. Now, I've talked before about not liking Gore-Tex <laughs> in shoes, and I have different reasons for that. But right. when it comes to a jacket that that I can wear in the rain or an environment like that in a humid tropical environment. Um, you really can't beat Gore-Tex, and some of the some of the, and Gore-Tex has come a long way recently, especially in terms of fabric that's used in jackets and things like that by companies like Patagonia and uh, North Face and Arterix and things like that. Jackets that are made with Gore-Tex are amazing, work amazingly well in it an environment like that. It works super great. And I get what he. I think I can see his perspective of not wanting to be warm, but I would I would argue that if it's raining, and you're trying to protect your skin, that's probably the best thing that you can do because you're going to get wet if you don't have something protecting yourself. Right. So getting wet is not going to help keep you cool. Um, it's really going to it, – it's just going to be counter to what he yeah. he. Plus it wants. makes you miserable right, if you're working exactly. and you're getting wet. So if you yeah. want to stay dry – but also not sweat a lot. That's what Gore-Tex was literally designed to do. So Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, maybe in the past, Benjamin, you've experienced putting on a rain jacket and sweating like crazy, but Gore-Tex is a totally different fabric, even though it may feel similar. Mm -hmm. And it is crazy how how well it works to keep your skin dry. Yeah, if I was, so if I was going to be in that environment, I guess kind of taking a look at it from his perspective, what I would probably have on is... um, Depending, of course, on you know what I was doing in that environment, I would I would try to have on probably a long sleeve shirt because I would probably argue that in a high humidity, you know, tropical environment like that, you're gonna have to worry about bugs and other things like that too. So I'd probably have something long sleeved on, but I would want a shirt that's going to do that same type of thing that a Gore-Tex jacket would do, which is wick sweat away from me. So. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily, I don't, I, I would definitely not be wearing like a layer underneath my pants. I would probably be wearing like a tweed pant or something like yeah. that. Something that will, that breathes because tweed breathes really well. And I've always been a big fan of that since I kind of discovered it. Um, and it's not inherently waterproof though. So depending on what kind of torrential downpour I have, I would probably have a pair of Gore-Tex pants to pull on over, you know, I want them to, you know, zip on the side so I could pull them on over my boots uh, if I had to in a in a, a rainy environment, and then I would throw in a Gore-Tex jacket over that long sleeve shirt, so that you know sweat was getting wicked away from me under that shirt, and then it eventually got carried into the layer that was the Gore-Tex and out of the system too. Yeah. So that would be my answer to that. I'd probably have something with a hood on it too. Good combination um, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. So that's my answer to that question. Hopefully cool. that helps. All right, thanks for tuning in to Gear Tasting Radio. As always, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network, and we'll get your questions fielded either here on Gear Tasting Radio or on our YouTube show, Gear Tasting, that we do on a weekly basis. Remember that Gear Tasting Radio comes out every Tuesday. We've got our regular Gear Tasting video show on YouTube every Thursday. And remember, if you like what we're doing, please uh, give us a shout on iTunes, let us know, leave us a comment, subscribe, rate, review, and thanks for listening.